Hello, and thank you for joining us for the third episode in the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Celebration Series, an eight part live webinar event that will share the experiences and recommendations of female leaders in fire and emergency management. The EDI Celebration Series is a program of the Canadian Association of Fire Chiefs in collaboration with Firefighting in Canada through a generous grant from the Motorola Solutions Foundation. My name is Laura Aiken, editor of Firefighting in Canada, and today we are joined by Nancy McDonald Duncan, Assistant Chief of Fire Prevention and Life Safety for Mississauga Fire and Emergency Services, and Deb Bergeson, Acting Deputy Chief of Organizational Effectiveness and Engagement for the Calgary Fire Department, who will both be sharing their career experiences and recommendations for increasing equity, diversity, and inclusion in the fire service. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can type them into the chat box on your screen at any time, and we will address them during question period after the interviews. With that, let's begin with Chief Ferguson. All right, welcome. Greetings and hello, everyone. Thanks for that uh, introduction, Laura. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to start by asking, why did you pursue this career path? Wow, uh, yes, firefighting. Um, I was uh, formerly an athlete and was very active and strong. I remember working in an office setting and sitting there in my confined nylons and skirt and saying, oh my, I have to be active. Um, I uh, am going to turn my uh, my education into something that, uh, that, would, that would allow me to be active. So that kind of... Um, presented to myself maybe the opportunities to be um, a phys ed teacher or a firefighter or a police officer. And so a firefighter I was, I heard that it was the best job in the world. And um, as a high achiever and someone who loved uh, customer service and providing customer service, that's the road I took. All right, so how did you get started? Well, obviously there were lots of looks of doubt, which I find very empowering to, <laughs> to, to be truthful. I, I never wanted to be less than. So I knew that it was a, a career choice that was typically a career choice of men. And actually I, I, I didn't know how many women were in the Calgary Fire Department at the time. Um, I didn't have any role model or um, any idea and in fact, it wasn't important to me. Gender wasn't important to me at that time, and I didn't, uh, I didn't know that it was an issue until I became a firefighter. So uh, I, I did an analysis of the skills I had, what it was going to take. I, I, I analyzed what it would take to be a firefighter, and I found that there wasn't much gap there. Um, I was completely in, independent, I suppose, in the way that I approached this and a way I a way I want. I, I, I went. I just wanted to to achieve. So what kind of training was it that you had when you started in the fire service? Uh, yes, I grew up uh, on a farm in rural Alberta, so lots of operating large equipment and using that common sense and, and working with my hands. I um, attended the University of Calgary and ended up with two degrees. One of them was in Fazette, and the other one was a Bachelor of Science in Psychology, which, um, by the way, has been very, uh, I, I've leaned on it a lot, actually, through my career. Um, I was an internationally ranked athlete. I was on the national luge team, and for anyone who doesn't know what luge is, it's when you lay on a sled really fast. Uh, I was on the national luge team for 10 years as well, so um, uh, was very um, strong and, and physically capable. I uh, also had uh, previous experience and um, my previous career was in customer service and in the hospitality industry actually running uh, the, the university uh, hotel business and um, I had just done a lot of projects for a multitude of industries and didn't didn't want anything to stand in my way so how would you characterize your experience as a woman in the fire service it was uh, and it has been um, a, a bit of a, a, a definitely a journey. Um, I didn't understand when I first got to the fire service why I could 
and and why I was so disliked. I'd, I'd never been disliked before, and and I didn't understand why. And then I had to um, get my head around it. It was because I was different, um, and I was different because of my gender. We had uh, two. Uh, women firefighters in the Calgary Fire Department at the time that I was hired and uh, at that time a force of a thousand so uh, a point zero three percent of um, females in the fire service here and in our city it, it was a very difficult and lonely journey um, I felt very over scrutinized because you do stand out when you look different um, I felt undervalued uh, of course, I brought all of these skills and credentials to our organization and then felt that they weren't um, leveraged and that uh, that I was, um, again, just, just not a highly scrutinized individual. I, I went through a phase in my journey that I would say it, it, I believed it was really important for me to assimilate. It was important for me to to gain to gain ground by being like everyone else, and then maybe they would like me. And uh, and now I'm to a point in my career where I can embrace the uniqueness and the difference that I bring to the organization, and uh, celebrate that and leverage that. So within those hurdles, were there any specific sort of instances that you can think of that you had? and how you overcame those specific hurdles? Um, yes, it, well, the, the big hurdle, the, the scrutiny hurdle, that's a, that's a tough one, except for to get used to always being watched and judged. Um, and then to know that you want no one else to go through that. So any uh, new firefighter to our organization or new equity seeking member of our organization, you want to make sure that uh, that you can be there to support that individual. Um, joining in with the, the crowd and being hard on yourself at some point, coping with that is to be okay in your own skin, to know that you don't have to be so hard on yourself and, and that you can be patient with yourself and accepting that you're different. Um, uh, also knowing, I guess, uh, th those hurdles and overcoming them, knowing that it's not just the internal audience that looks at you as though you're different. Um, it's our society that expects that most of our firefighters are going to be you know, large um, white males. And and so uh, accepting that we can't change the world and accept, uh, especially we can't change the world overnight is one of those ways of kind of overcoming that particular hurdle. But there's, um, I, I always lean on this quote from Marianne Williamson. Um, it, it goes, our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. It's, um, it's that we're powerful beyond measure. And she goes on to say that there's nothing enlightened and, and about shrinking so that other people don't feel insecure around you. So we just have to let our own light shine and unconsciously by doing that, it gives others the permission space to do the same. And, and that's what this EDI series is all about, I think, is that you're allowing me to shine and um, unconsciously or, or maybe consciously or just by the fact that people can see um, women in fire leadership positions, it allows others the permission to do the same. Hopefully it'll be easier. Yeah, absolutely. So on the note of leadership positions, aside from your experience as a woman, how would you characterize your experience as a leader in the fire service? Of course, there are a few more eyes on you, um, I suppose. It's really, really important to me that I show up each and every day um, with that focus on how I'm showing up each and every day. Um, there's that thing that that goes those at the fr at the front of the line take all of the bullets and that's okay with me because i know by taking those bullets um and not dodging those bullets that i'm making things easier for others so um the experience in the fire service as a leader um has given me more voice and and that's a, a wonderful thing uh, rather than being silenced through most of my career and and i'm sure that those of you who are in the fire service and and see themselves um, gaining rank and moving up that hierarchy with stripes become uh, comes your voice and and now I'm able to speak with that voice that is different and um, 
and, and then I can I can I can be different and I can bring things to our organization to hopefully round out our organization. Absolutely. So on the topic of uh, EDI, what are your top three recommendations to fire departments seeking to create a more diverse, equitable and inclusive workforce? Wow. And that's some of the work I get to do. So this is a beautiful stuff. I, I love it. Um, we have to recognize that there's existing systems of um, power and privilege and oppression in the fire industry. And so when I look at that, I think about, it's not just about bringing diverse people to our organization, it, it's supporting them. It's that inclusive piece. So we have to take a look at the hiring. Um, first and foremost, there's that propensity, I think, to hire folks who look just like us. And with an organization of, um, primarily uh, Caucasian males, um, we tend to hire again those people who look just like us. So the recommendation there is to look at your definition of a good firefighter. And if that definition of a good firefighter is one that eliminates others from joining your organization, then it's uh, it's time to put some additional efforts into that. So does the traditional definition, definition and mental image come to your mind of what the best firefighter is for your organization? And, and if it's the same, same, then, then we're not going to be supporting anything different. So be really, really aware of that tendency to hire those who are similar to me um, or that confirmation bias because hiring the same people by the same people is just going to create the same product. So who's doing the hiring in your organization? Um, who sits on, on the promotional panels in your organization? Um, are they straight, white, able-bodied males? And if you don't want the same product, make sure that those people are willing to learn and to take the perspective of those um, who aren't like them. Um, and if not, round out that hiring process and those promotional panels with, um, with, with those who are, are not the same, same. Um, the second thing that I would suggest is checking biases. So really um, take a look at the organization. Take a look at all of the policies that you have. Um, know that there are talents and perspectives that are being oppressed. So uh, if there are perspectives that are not being considered, let's take a look at the equity seeking groups within our organizations and bring them to the table. It, uh, it's looking at your systems and your policies and your workplaces and your practices and who is taking a look at those. So if the people who are analyzing these, um, these pieces of our industry and, and the organization, if, if these folks aren't able to look with um, a very open mind, then it's time to take a, uh, to get some other folks to take a look at the processes within our organizations. And the third, um, when we talk about uh, what I recommend is to celebrate the allies and showcase their behaviors. I know that I wouldn't be where I am without the advocacy of some really, really special people. So uh, these people are courageous, um, particularly if they are already very comfortable within our organization as those who are traditionally accepted, they have stepped out and, and take being, uh, being beaten up and, and risked stepping out of the in group to provide people like me opportunity. And though that, um, the, the privilege gives advantages and it benefits members of dominant groups. Um, we, we definitely need to um, add fuel to the tanks of those allies so that we can um, make sure that, that they're sharing the privilege and that we do as well. Absolutely. And so for those looking to follow the path you know, to a leadership position in FIRE, what three recommendations might you have for them? Um, I can only trust that, <laughs> that my path may work for others, but I, I do understand that everyone has their own path. And especially when you're blazing trails, there's, there's no given way to do this. But what I've found has worked for me, and, and maybe these are just relatively recent um, discoveries, but but showcasing your uniqueness. We have to understand that we were hired to an organization for what we brought to the table. 
there probably wasn't an assessment um, when you went through the hiring process of how you were going to assimilate and how you were going to be the same as everyone else. So uh, these are times um, right now to not be the same, same, same. Our organization and our industry is calling for um, diversity, for inclusion, um, for that self-reflection that it's taking. Uh, we're putting a, 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 micros a microscope, I think, on our organization. So um, know that you bring something special to the organization. Uh, that's why you've survived. That's why you've become a leader. That's why um, you're on this leadership journey. But leverage that and, and fly that flag really, really high. Know that you're making a change because that change is needed. Um, the, a, another recommendation, I, I suppose, um, regarding uh, seeking leadership in, in fire is to find patience. It's so easy to fall into that rut of being as hard on yourself as others are on you. So finding that um, patience to know that you need to create some space for yourself. Uh, it, it's really tough when you look different and you talk differently. Um, know that you might be planting seeds every time you speak and even though you might not see the immediate results that we on the on the front lines like to see um, that immediate mitigation those seeds may be taking root and may someday make a di make a difference so uh, it takes courage um, to, to be patient because there's often times that you're being dismissed that you're being talked over and that your ideas are all of a sudden considered brilliant when presented by somebody else. So uh, patience, patience, dear Deb. Um, and the other, uh, the third one is to build the momentum. What I what I try to prioritize is to make sure to bring others along with me. It's not a, a Deb journey, it's a, an all equity seeking um, members journey. So promote those uh, other individuals and know that they all can't have my position, but if ever there's a possibility for someone to sit on a committee or, or, or allow their voices to be heard, leverage that. And again, as you're taking the bullets, know that those same bullets won't be hitting those behind you. Share those experiences, um, share the fact that you've had these hurdles and these barriers and, and this is what it's like so that they're better prepared. For sure, they'll be much more successful than I am, but um, I think at some point I will uh, sit back and, and just hope that I've made things easier for them. Oh, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and recommendations. Great insights, absolutely. I'm going to turn it over to Chief McDonald Duncan now. Good afternoon, Hello. Laura. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Welcome. All right. So please tell me, why did you pursue this career path? So I always say I didn't pursue it, it pursued me. And I say that jokingly, but um, somewhat jokingly. I didn't start out uh, looking at um, a fire service career. My career started uh, in more of a, a law um, career. I was a law clerk paralegal for a law clerk, a law clerk uh, uh, firm, a lawyer's firm in um, St. Catharines. And uh, in that, I ended up being one of the first licensed paralegals um, that was in Ontario. And at the time, um, when I transitioned from the law firm to a prosecution position, there was um, a large number of illegal marijuana grow operations in the Niagara region. And the fire chief at the time in Niagara Falls, uh, Pat Burke, um, had one of his firefighters entangled in a fire one night at one of these illegal grow operations. And he decided that he was not going to have one of his firefighters hurt, injured, or um, killed in, in a fire like that. And so he directed his staff to inspect any of these operations that were found and to lay any charges um, then if they discovered fire code deficiencies. He had a young inspector at the time who was very, um, gung-ho to get this going, believed in it, and he laid several hundred charges in a very short period of time. That same inspector, who's now a deputy chief in Toronto, spent a lot of time and hours with me 
getting uh, so that I can get to know the fire code inside and out. Because to be a good prosecutor, you need to know the elements of the charge and the evidence that you're going to need to put forward in order to succeed. And from that, the fire chief ended up being the fire marshal. And when Pat Burke became the Ontario Fire Marshal, he realized that there was a problem in Ontario with illegal grow operations, and he wanted to make a difference. And he wanted to create a team that would work very similar to what Niagara Falls had done, which included a prosecutor. So I applied, I was fortunate enough to get the job, and my career took off from there. Initially, I was uh, providing advice and assistance to the fire service throughout Ontario on inspections, enforcements, how to lay charges, how to prepare for charges. I started coaching, or not coaching, but teaching at the Ontario Fire College as an adjunct inspect, uh, instructor. And um, my career just blossomed. I started taking the courses myself to understand more and more about um, the fire code and um, how, how everything works with the fire code. And then I transitioned into the fire uh, service from there, um, initially as a division chief. I then um, went back to the fire marshal's office for um, another few years. Again, I continued to take more and more courses, realizing that I was really beginning to um, like this career. And I really enjoyed the fact that I could help uh, people and I could help inspectors and I could help make you know our communities safer um, and then I transitioned to Mississauga um, as a division chief again and uh, was fortunate enough to be promoted to an assistant chief position in prevention uh, within a year and a half of that and most recently I was fortunate enough to be acting chief during COVID for a period of time um, so that's sort of how I got here <laughs> Yes, interesting path coming coming from the legal side. So how would you, you know, now characterize your experience as a woman in the fire service? And so I've been very lucky, I will be honest. Um, I think I came in at a very good time, um, unlike, um, you know, other other women in the fire service. There were lots of women in the fire service at the time but when i came in i was coming into an area of prevention that and i had a unique skill set because of my prosecution background i had gained a lot of knowledge um, throughout the years at the fire marshal's office and so uh and it was a time when the fire marshal was you know basically encouraging departments to start enforcing more that they had you know the ability to enforce the ability to make change in their communities and they should be utilizing those tools. So for me, I was really lucky because it was a skill set that not everyone had. And so I had, you know, uh, luckily the, you know, the ability to come in and, and share that experience and to help um, with the department to make us, you know, as good as we could get in that area. So what hurdles, if any, do you feel you had to overcome? So I think the biggest hurdle for me, um, as much as the prosecution background was an asset for me, it was also a hurdle because um, as I came into the fire service, I think initially, at least, I was looked at as being the prosecutor and not uh, recognized that I had other knowledge. I had the fire code knowledge. I had the building code knowledge. I'd been an investigator, um, a fire investigator. And so I had all of this other knowledge um, about the fire service and fire prevention, but I was being looked at as being, you know, just simply this one um, kind of pillar in that. Uh, so it was it was having to break down those those walls and really show um, that there was more to me than just just that part of it. All right, and how would you? characterize your experience as a leader in the fire service? So um, again, for me, it's been a good experience. Um, I came in, when I came in as the division chief, um, I felt that, you know, I had an opportunity to make change and to build um, in our prevention area. Um, I, I worked hard to create communication uh, an open door policy so that um, we could have and have good discussions about what was working and what perhaps was not working. 
And because the, the whole idea was that we could have a good uh, fire prevention department that would be seen as leaders. Um, and so I felt that I was doing um, as much as I could to open lines of communication and um, to build relationships. Because I really think that that's the most important thing nowadays is to build relationships with your staff. Definitely. So what are your top three recommendations to fire departments seeking to create a more diverse, equitable and inclusive workforce? So very similar to what's already been said, um, I think one of the big things is you have to focus on who it is that you're looking to encourage to come into the fire service. So we have to get into the communities more and we have to really reach out to our residents to say, you know, th these are the things that a career in fire will provide you. And these are the things that, that you may be interested in um, and that you do have the skill set. And I think those come through town hall meetings and community, community engagements. When we're out there doing public education events, that's our opportunity to speak to people and say, you know, have you ever thought about a career in fire? I think we have to stop focusing on what uh, we want them to bring to us and start looking at what they are bringing to us. Um, there is, again, as said before, there are unique skill sets out there that will only enhance our fire service, but sometimes we're not looking for them. We're looking at certain skills and that's all we're looking at, or sometimes certain educational backgrounds and that's all we're looking at. So I think we really have to um, think more openly. I do agree that I think sometimes in order to change and to, to really help um, you know, nurture this this change in, in how we look at people and how we hire people requires training. And I think that we need to start training at a much earlier uh, stage in the game on diversity, but most importantly, on that unconscious bias. Are we just not seeing that we're not looking at other people that we're only focusing on a certain, you know, type of person or color of person or, you know, gender? And if that's it, we need we need training. We need to understand and recognize in ourselves so that we will open the doors for for so many more that I'm sure are out there and would love to have a career in, in fire, but maybe don't even understand it or even recognize it. Yep, absolutely. And then what are your top three recommendations for those seeking leadership positions in fire? So number one, I would say, be open. If you have a desire to you know, be a leader, you have to talk about it. You have to express that desire and that ambition so that people see you as that person. And in some ways I am speaking you know, from my own experience, because I'm not a person that says this is where I want to be in 10 years in this department and I'm looking at, you know, sitting in the chief's um, seat, I think sometimes people just don't look at you. And you need to express that and say, yeah, you know, one day maybe I do want to be chief and maybe I'd like to, to set my sights on that. So talking about it, I think is very important. Recognizing that that's the direction you want to go is very important. But secondly, if, if you are thinking about that, reach out and find a mentor, find a coach. I have been helped so many times and in so many ways by other um, you know, deputies and chiefs and colleagues um, that have seen things in me that I haven't even seen in myself. And they are the ones that have encouraged me to continue on this path um, way before I, I realized it was the path I wanted to go on. And I think that's that's important. And if you see yourself as that next generation leader, reach out and find someone that can, you know, be there to support you, but also mentor you and coach you on, you know, what types of courses do you need to have? What is it you need to do to 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 be seen um, and to get there and take that next step? And uh, last lastly, I think you have to believe in lifetime learning. You have to understand that the training you are receiving 
is not going to end tomorrow. And it's not just training on, you know, how do we put out fires or how do I do an inspection or, um, you know, how do I teach someone else to do these skills? The, the really important training as a leader nowadays is your soft skills. You have to learn how to talk to people. You have to learn how to engage people. And by people, I mean your staff. As you move up, you know, you want to be setting the right example. You want to be showing them that, that they are as important to this organization as you are. And those are the soft skills. And unfortunately, we, I don't believe that we've spent enough time training on those skills. And it's time again that we need to, to look at them, especially if you're going to be a leader in this new generation, because this new generation is not the old generation where, you know, the hard, the hard knocks approach works on everything. They need the soft skills and they have the ability to do a good job if, if we just think about that for a little bit. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing these wonderful insights. It's time to see what questions have come in. Um, yeah, let's see Ferguson come back on. Um, so I'm going to toss one out here for each of you to answer. What character trait do you think has helped you most in your career? And maybe I'll start with uh, Chief Ferguson. Sure. Um, hmm, the character trait, probably resiliency. Um, there, uh, I, I've found the need to be resilient as a firefighter, as a lieutenant, as a captain, and now um, a member of the the chief's leadership team. Um, resiliency has uh, kept me in the game. Um, along with um, that lifelong learning character trait as well, um, making sure that you keep on um, putting more tools in the toolbox. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I agree. Um, it's, you know, the lifelong learning is, is essential. It is because things are always changing and you always have to gr keep growing yourself. Um, the other thing I think for me is that I, I have a firm belief that you give back. So as I grow and I improve and I reach higher, I also need to bring somebody with me. So I need to give back and, you know, spend time with others that are just starting to come up the path. And I think that in the end, that, that has given me a lot of uh, respect in not just in this job but in other jobs as well all right i've got uh, one more question if you could give your younger self at the start of your career one piece of advice what would it be <laughs> well <laughs> isn't <laughs> hindsight 2020 i i i actually would have said Hey, Deb, why didn't you invest in this thing called a face mask? Because someday there's going to be this huge pandemic and you're going to be a bazillionaire. Um, <laughs> but uh, but that it didn't work out that way. Um, younger self at the start of my career, um, I, I would have encouraged myself to be more assertive, um, to, to make sure that I was creating that space for myself. Um, throughout my career, uh, and and maybe to fight internalizing some of the messages that you hear throughout your career, uh, that isn't your narrative, and it doesn't have to be your narrative. Um, by, I, I guess, internalizing that negative self belief, it, it gets in in the way. You're allowed to make mistakes, and um, and be, be patient and kind to yourself. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm hearing what you're saying and I'm like, yeah, I, I totally agree. If I had to uh, give some advice to myself when I was younger, I think it would be a lot of that. Be, don't be afraid to say what you want and where you're heading and, or where you want to head and where you hope to be. Don't be afraid to, um, you know, to express those things and, and, you know, be willing to understand that not everybody's going to think the same way you are. So maybe they won't appreciate you saying that. Maybe they won't uh, support you in saying that, but you can't give up and you still, you need to express it sooner. You need to, to let people 
know that that you know you have different desires you have you have ambition too all right so i've got another question come in here um what can people like me a white male firefighter do to become more of an ally and to support and grow an inclusive workplace Certainly, um, I'll I'll jump on that. It, it's mostly about perspective taking, from what I have found, and and believe me, I try to take your perspective as well. And and these are tough times, I think, uh, in our world for uh, and in our industry for white male firefighters. Right? It, it must feel like you're you're being attacked or that you're losing something. But know that there's there's lots and lots. It's it's not a finite piece of attention or a finite um a uh, pot of soup that that we're that we're um eating for lunch um there's enough for all of us so taking that perspective taking the perspective and listening to the stories of um equity seeking members i think is really important because through those stories you can understand um the experiences the emotion of those experiences uh, some of the players and and hopefully recognize some of those repetitive systemic issues that need to be confronted so you know what thank you even by asking that question you're on the on the right path i appreciate the support i really don't think i have anything to add you said it very succinctly all right well that looks like it wraps up our questions Thank you to all our participants and each attendee for their time today. This webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to all those registered within 24 hours. And we hope you enjoyed this session and have a great day. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Greetings from the fire department. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye, -bye. <laughs>